The current progress of the U.S. return to the moon program is falling short of expectations, and at this point, there's a serious possibility that China could get there first. Fortunately, a newly proposed plan could help the U.S. regain momentum. What makes this plan especially noteworthy is that it calls for an unprecedented collaboration between SpaceX, Blue Origin, and United Launch Alliance. So, let's take a closer look at how this plan actually works. Here is the current reality of the moon program we are facing. The Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft are being considered for termination after Artemis III, which would be the program's first lunar landing. It is true that both systems are extremely expensive. However, they are operational today, and for the foreseeable future, they remain the only proven means of sending astronauts beyond low Earth orbit. A more immediate concern lies with the human landing system, in this case, SpaceX's Starship. The program is facing serious challenges, raising doubts about whether it can be ready in time for the upcoming moon landing mission. Starship promises extraordinary capabilities. SpaceX has stated it will be able to deliver up to 100 metric tons of cargo to the lunar surface. However, progress has been slower than both NASA and SpaceX had hoped. Development of the upper stage, which is intended to become the lunar landing variant of Starship, has especially struggled to keep pace. On Tuesday, May 27th, the Block 2 variant of Starship, designed to address previous performance issues, failed for a third consecutive time. Most recently, a prototype exploded on the test stand. Even once Starship successfully reaches orbit, which was supposed to be the relatively straightforward part of the program, it must still demonstrate the ability to transfer large amounts of cryogenic propellant in orbit. It also needs to store that propellant without boil off for up to 100 days and eventually carry out an uncrewed moon landing without tipping over. Each of these is a major milestone and achieving them all within a tight timeline is a massive undertaking. To be fair, the program has already achieved some remarkable successes. One of the most notable was SpaceX guiding Starship's first stage, the most powerful rocket booster ever built back to its launch site and catching it using mechanical arms on the launch tower. It was a stunning achievement. The main challenge now lies with the upper stage. SpaceX is working hard to make it fully reusable while still being able to carry massive payloads. That combination has proven extremely difficult. But perhaps it is worth asking a different question. What if we focus only on the parts of Starship that are already close to working? If we treat Starship as a partially reusable rocket, similar in concept to Falcon 9 but scaled up, it would still represent a major advancement. Could this simplified version of Starship be adapted for the moon mission? Is that a feasible solution? It turns out that within the Artemis program, some elements are in better shape than others. Starship is not the only lunar lander under contract. The second human landing system contractor is Blue Origin with its Blue Moon Lander. Blue Origin is currently developing the Blue Moon Mark I, a robotic lander capable of delivering up to three metric tons to the lunar surface. It uses some of the same technologies, such as the BE-7 engine. As the larger Mark II human-rated version, the company has confirmed that the Blue Moon Mark I will fly for the first time this year, targeting the Moon's South Pole. This mission is part of a task order awarded through NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. It will carry a camera payload and is currently in final assembly at a facility in Florida with plans to leave the factory in about six weeks. However, the crewed Blue Moon Mark II lander is more complex. Like Starship, it depends heavily on orbital refueling. Its hydrogen and oxygen propellants must be launched by at least four separate tanker flights and delivered to lunar orbit by a reusable vehicle called the Cislinar Transporter. This means that, before the first crewed landing can occur, Blue Origin must develop not just the lander itself, but also the tankers and the cislunar transporter. Now earlier, we discussed using only the proven parts of Starship. In theory, if SpaceX's vehicle could be used solely to deliver the Blue Origin lander to lunar orbit, it might significantly reduce the development burden on both programs. This kind of hybrid approach could offer a more practical path forward. 
To make this architecture work, there's one more component that needs to be added, the Centaur 5 Earth Departure Stage. The Centaur's role is to perform the translunar injection, TLI, burn, which requires about 3,200 meters per second of delta V. Despite being based on 60-year-old technology, its RL-10 engines still boast one of the highest specific impulses in the industry at 465.5 seconds. This makes the Centaur well-suited for the job, requiring only minimal modifications for the mission. However, structural reinforcements may be necessary, as Blue Moon is significantly more massive than the Centaur's typical 27-ton payloads. After putting all the components together, here's the updated mission plan that has been proposed. An expendable variant of SpaceX's Starship will launch a lunar lander stack into a stable low Earth orbit. This stack consists of a fully fueled Centaur upper stage, which will serve as the Earth departure stage and the Blue Moon Mark II lander. To enable direct injection to the moon without requiring in-space refueling, Blue Moon has been modified to reduce its dry mass by three metric tons while still retaining full mission capability. Once the stack reaches low Earth orbit, Centaur will propel Blue Moon on a translunar trajectory, delivering it to a near-rectilinear halo orbit, NRHO, around the moon. Separately, the Artemis III crew will launch aboard an Orion spacecraft. Instead of using the Gateway Space Station, which is now proposed for cancellation, Orion will dock directly with Blue Moon in NRHO. Two astronauts will transfer to the lander. Blue Moon will then undock from Orion and descend to the lunar surface for a six-day surface mission. During this time, Orion will remain in NRHO. After completing the surface operations, Blue Moon will ascend and rendezvous with Orion. The crew will transfer back into Orion, and Blue Moon will be jettisoned for disposal. Orion will then initiate a three-burn trans-Earth injection maneuver. Prior to Earth re-entry, the European Service Module will be jettisoned. Orion will re-enter Earth's atmosphere and splash down in the Pacific Ocean, where the crew and lunar samples will be recovered by the U.S. Navy. This plan was proposed by an organization called America Space, which has been dedicated to covering space exploration for many years. Their content is typically well-researched and reliable. You can look them up to explore the full details of the plan. The core objective of this mission underscores a critical reality. All participating companies are operating under an aggressive timeline to develop key components for the ambitious goal of returning humans to the moon. SpaceX brings a powerful and relatively low-cost launch vehicle to the table, but it doesn't yet have a lander ready for deployment. Blue Origin has developed a lunar lander, but lacks a rocket capable of sending it directly to the moon. United Launch Alliance contributes an exceptionally efficient upper stage, yet when launched on the standard Vulcan rocket, much of its propellant is spent just reaching orbit. By strategically combining the strengths of each company, a new mission architecture takes shape, one that enables a lander to be ready by the end of 2028 and capable of completing its mission with a single launch. This eliminates the need for complex and risky in-space refueling. The architecture emphasizes using existing or in-development hardware, reducing the risk of delays and keeping costs under control. As an interim solution for lunar landings, it offers a realistic and achievable path forward. Most importantly, this plan may give the United States the opportunity to return humans to the moon before China does. China's space program has been advancing at an impressive pace. In 2021, China launched the Tiangong Space Station, its own permanently crewed alternative to the International Space Station, and has since completed four successful lunar missions, including the first ever landing on the far side of the moon. The Chinese government has set a clear objective to land humans on the moon. By 2030, it has also engaged in discussions with Russia about jointly developing a lunar base within the next decade. China's lunar program is methodically structured into four phases, each building on the technologies and knowledge gained in the previous stage. Phase 1 focused on achieving lunar orbit accomplished through the Chang'e 1 mission in 2007 and Chang'e 2 in 2010. 
Phase 2 emphasized landing and surface operations with Chang'e 3 landing in 2013 and Chang'e 4 making history in 2019 by becoming the first mission to land on the far side of the moon. Phase 3 involves sample return missions. Chang'e 5 successfully brought back material from the near side in 2020 and Chang'e 6 followed in 2024 with the first ever samples from the far side. Phase 4 centers on building a robotic research station near the moon's south pole, a region of strategic interest due to its potential reserves of water ice, an essential resource for long-term lunar exploration. These efforts are paving the way for China's ultimate goal, sending astronauts to the moon. To achieve this, China is developing three key systems. The first is the Long March 10, a new heavy lift rocket purpose-built for lunar missions. It features two side boosters, three core stages, stands about 90 meters tall, and weighs approximately 2,187 tons at launch. It can carry up to 70 tons to low Earth orbit and 27 tons to a lunar transfer orbit. As of April 2024, China announced the completion of the rocket's development. The second system is the Next Generation Crewed Spacecraft, NGCS, which is designed to carry three astronauts and includes a service module for power and propulsion. Prototype testing began as early as 2016. The third component is a lunar lander designed to carry two astronauts from lunar orbit to the surface and back. While still in development, it is expected to function similarly to landers used during NASA's Apollo and Artemis missions. Due to the Long March 10's payload limitations to lunar orbit, China plans to conduct two launches per crewed mission, one for the spacecraft and another for the lander. Once in lunar orbit, the two vehicles will rendezvous and dock, allowing the crew to transfer and ascend to the surface. The first crewed lunar mission is expected to feature a brief surface stay of six to eight hours, during which the astronauts will use a small electric rover capable of traveling up to 10 kilometers. At first glance, China's lunar ambitions may appear to replicate what the United States achieved decades ago. However, the long-term goal aligns more closely with NASA's Artemis program to establish a sustained human presence on the moon. China is already testing materials and technologies for a future lunar base and is preparing the industrial and logistical infrastructure necessary to support permanent operations. That said, China has not yet conducted a circumlunar crewed mission, a critical milestone that usually precedes a lunar landing. While there is still a long way ahead, China's approach is technically sound, carefully phased, and relatively low risk compared to the more experimental architecture of Artemis. Ultimately, China's ambitions in space extend beyond exploration. They are part of a broader strategy to drive economic growth through an expanding space industry, enable lunar and asteroid mining, and secure national interests by establishing a permanent presence in near-Earth space and on the moon.